Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are at the beginning of a feedback session from the jury to uh, pianists who did not make it to the second stage. Uh, it's common in competitions, in some of them, to have a jury feedback sessions uh, where the jury members or some of them talk to the participants and give them feedback but I don't know about an example of doing it in front of the public and, and the live broadcast. Uh, the aim is not only to give feedback, but to let you, uh, watchers, listeners, uh, understand what interests the jury members, how do they listen to the participants, what do they, do they value more or less in their playing. So I hope we all can learn a lot from such a session. So let me invite three members of the jury uh, who uh, will do this session. Jochevet uh, Kaplinski. Robert Levin. And uh, Emil Naumov. And I would like to invite the first uh, pianist, brave pianist, the first to be in such a session, Sean, please come. Hello. Thank you. Hi. First of all, I, I would like to say that um, it takes a lot of bravery to face the jury after you get disappointing news. So thank you for coming here and being here and willing, being willing to learn from this experience. Absolutely, I love hearing feedbacks from people like you. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you. Ah, I have a microphone, okay. You know, when I have the honor of serving in a, a jury of a competition as renowned as, as this one, uh, I come in preparing to fall in love with the performances that will be offered. And uh, I want not just to be impressed, but to be personally moved uh, by getting a sense of storytelling, of uh, uh, bringing us into the world that this music means to you, and by showing us your enthusiasm and your excitement, uh, you bring us closer to this music and uh, make us extremely grateful to you for your being an ambassador to the composers who are no longer here to speak themselves, although of course we have the Israeli pieces and so we have the, the bridge between the past and, and, and the future. So, uh, you know, you may have a, an impression that the jury is just sitting there and writing down objections to little things that you did. Oh, you played a wrong note in bar 14, so they're going to write that, you know. But I don't think most of us work that way at all. You know, we, we respond to the message that you give us and uh, try uh, in protocoling our impressions, we, we try actually not only to help ourselves when the judgment time comes, but also in the possibility of a, a, an encounter like this one, how we can be the most help to you. I probably should speak last because um, I had the pleasure of working with Sean and Juilliard. Um, in the past, and um, you know, I've followed his. I've known him for many years because I taught him in, in Aspen when he was what, 15, 16, uh, and I've seen him grow. And I was personally very gratified by the growth that I hear in his playing and by the the personal commitment to the playing. And what I heard was something that was rather rare here, and that is humor 
you manage to capture humorous moments in uh, almost all the pieces, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, there is, though, the expectation when you play here of a certain professionalism and reliability, and maybe um, starting with the Beethoven was not the best move, and the, the opening was a little shaky. Uh, you, you gathered yourself together after that, but you know, in competitions, and I tell this to all my students who enter competitions, uh, in competitions, you have such a short time to form an impression that the first impression is very important. And whether you want it to be or not, whether the ju jury wants it to be or not, it is. You, you know, we can't avoid it. Uh, we have a limited time to form an impression. We listen very, very intently in the beginning. And if the beginning is shaky, it works against you. I don't know uh, exactly how other people felt, but um, I was worried when you started. Uh, and. Um, I, I was worried not about the results, but I was worried about you. And, and when you create this feeling of worrisome uh, feeling, it's not a matter of a note being, miss, uh, being missed or not, but it's a matter of feeling like the, the uh, performer is not on firm ground, that there's something slightly off. Uh, and. So that may have gotten in your way, and you need to know in the future that beginnings and auditions and competitions are really, really important. But I did feel that uh, you breathed a certain life into uh, the contemporary piece, the Israeli piece, that um, very few people have in, you know, before you. And I really enjoyed the way that you just gave yourself completely to the music at that point. Well, I'd like to uh, second uh, what my colleague just said. Uh, for instance, listening objectively to how you began the first movement of the Beethoven Sonata and how you played the recapitulation was a huge gap because by the time you got back, you were in stride. And, and it was very, very clear that you were more confident uh, and more inside the music, whereas at the beginning, it, it felt more tentative. Uh, I cannot stress enough the importance when playing music by mm -hmm. Beethoven and Haydn, among others, how important humor and wit actually are. Uh, and you're on your way there, and I think you can do more, because there's something at times almost outrageous about some of these things that Beethoven does. And you want the audience to chuckle a little bit with you, instead of feeling that you're doing a, a dutiful, uh, responsible uh, performance of, of the piece, and everything is more or less in line but uh, with, without having a, a sense of the wickedness of these things. And the way Beethoven, for instance, sometimes likes to, to uh, play with banality. You know, I mean, if you think about, uh, Emil and I were talking about this a little while ago, I th imagine that if Mozart were still alive when Beethoven came to, to Vienna, and Beethoven came into the composition lesson with, with Mozart, and he showed him this B flat sonata, and he got to bam, da dam, ba bam, da 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 dam, da dam, ba bam, ba 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 ba. He said, Ludwig, Ludwig, for God's sake! I mean, it's distressing that you had a thought like that, but that you put it down on paper is unforgivable. You see, so there there is this this provocative aspect of the music and and the liveliness in it. And I think you're well on your way towards that, but I think there's room for, for quite a bit more. Such words of wisdom that I hear here are wonderful because it's um, important for you to feel that when we listen, we root for the candidate who plays. And um, I find it very uh, moving to discover the inner world, the sound frame in which the imagination of the piece for what it means to each of you when you play, and in this case to you when you started the Beethoven, I immediately entered in your world. The way you played, you played it 
quasi 30 seconds as if there was a grace knot group. And I felt like we're here into, um, I felt imagination of a garden and um, having a, a butterfly fly from one to, to the other. The butterfly, da, da. Let me tell you this and this and that. And factually, when the opening is so, uh, of course, the audacity of the openings escape us today after the other styles we've heard composed after, but when the Alberti bass comes in place, it's almost as if it says, okay, children, now behave. And it sounds almost as if now the frame is placed after we had the initial burst. And the same B flat major pattern is used in Haydn's E flat major sonata concluding the exposition. And I find that that crisp articulation that you brought was very much in a propos with the um, uh, piano fortes of the time. Uh, in the sense that every note has its own burst and taste. And um, I found that uh, the, what I, I thought is, oh, we are given this very interesting um, invitation to enter in this world. And it, it continued becoming interesting in the way you treated the minuetto. You know, generally, uh, composers don't write the B section first. They write the B section as the something else section because all the drive of the thematic material is in the A section. But I thought that it was very interesting the way you treated that, that uh, G section, well, the B section in G. Uh, with a lot of um, energy, but remaining very elegant in the articulation, especially because the pianofortes had such a different range quality of t of sound, like uh, because of the straight strong among other things, among other things, it was like the woodwinds, strings, or brass, like in this symphonic. Um, uh, playing, and the modern pianos tend to be more uh, homogeneous on each range, and uh, which is good, but uh, sometimes becomes a bit too obvious that everything sounds very prettiful, not that meaningful. And what struck me in your playing in the sonata was that you played very meaningful. You came on stage to play what it means to you. And um, I was um, uh, very um, driven by the sound, um, I would say, the, 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 the sound garden that you created, because it was something very personal. And so finally, when I over, offer here in Germany, when they say, Spielen Sie sicher oder musikalisch? is played safe or musical. And I think that it's, of course, not subtle to say that. But um, generally, because it's a competitive situation, we try to think to play careful or at least controlled. But it's not incompatible with that um, impulse. And I find that um, if I have anything to suggest, besides the wonderful teaching which you received, is to continue developing your own voice, because you certainly have a compelling voice as, a, as an artist, and I think that is very important, besides what everybody individually can think of the same piece. As one of my students said, how come it, the same piece means so many things to so many people? But it is true, but progressively it becomes yours. And today, I, I think it was a beautiful demonstration. You, you should think about how your audience is going to respond to the piece within your hands, within the way you look at it. 
because, of course, different people may know the piece very, very well or, or scarcely. And when something happens which is logical and normative, then the audience will expect it and uh, you will be treading on familiar ground. But when Beethoven does something unexpected, or as in this case, in the middle of the second movement, something absolutely astounding mm -hmm. with, with chords that turn your blood to ice, I mean, it's just, uh, I'll just... You, you play, play for them. Just, just the middle, the middle of uh, the G's in the left hand and let them, let them hear that sound so we know what we're talking about. <laughs> Good, good. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's one of the most shocking sounds in all of music, and it's hard to imagine anyone before Beethoven having written something like that. So there, there is a kind of an electric shock that goes through the body when one hears that. So you might actually want to play chords like that in, in a, 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 a more accentuated way rather than a, a, a more uh, gentle way because, because you, you want to shake the, the audience up a little. Because, you know, first of all, you've just arrived in B flat major. The mere fact that you're playing a pedal tone in G in the left hand is in itself anything but logical. And then you play a B natural, and I'm hearing the tune that you played at the beginning of the piece. Now it's in G major instead of E flat major, which is pretty weird in itself. But that's just the beginning, you see. You start and you, you say, oh, I'm going to play it in, in G major, and then suddenly, Bleh! you know, you, you, you really have to understand what, what Beethoven is thinking about in, in writing a piece like this, in, in setting up a, a, a mood and then doing something which is utterly shocking. There's a certain irreverence in the piece in, at certain moments that I missed a little. And, and that also includes the, some of the sforzandos in the first movement. Uh, the ta, 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 ta. Uh, and, you know, in other places, there are certain moments that, where he's just jabbing. You know, it's like, you know, here, wake up. Uh, and you didn't do enough of that. I That's can also. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mimi. I'm sorry. I just wanted. No, no. Because the conversation brings in branches of thoughts. The sforzandos in Beethoven, these kind of implosions. Um, uh, it's more like in this imagination of the string players playing at yom pom pom, and they continue in that energy, and um, the bow. And uh, the piano is not a board instrument, mm. but it is true that um, Beethoven injects these energizing uh, jolts. And um, I agree, um, they could be also to do with voicing. I mean, there are many ways, but it is true that um, uh, it's, it it's strikes me how much most of the Beethoven sonatas are written in string quartet texture. And therefore, that impulse in the in energization of the sound, they do more naturally that on the, with the bow than on the piano, where it could appear like more like a ta. I had a teacher who used to say that sforzando means, for God's sake, do something. <laughs> and, um, and that's always a good thing to think about because it's not necessarily loud, yeah. but it is a statement of something, and that is appropriate for that particular passage, and you always have to think that. When you start, when you start the movement, the first movement, uh, you know, you're, you're doing something which is slightly conspiratorial. You're saying to the audience, get it? Because you, you do something and then you stop, right? And then you, you say, no, I mean it, and you do it again. No one can believe you, could do it. you did it the first time, you're already doing it the second. And then when it, suddenly you get this melody at the top of the range, as if he's saying, God, life is fantastic, isn't it? What a gorgeous day it is out. Let's, let's go out and have some fun, you know? But there's the difference between the character of the snide and the, and the teasing and the tickling of the and, and suddenly this extraordinary lyricism and joy that develops the piece. There's no way that you can exaggerate those things. You know, it's technicolor, not black and white. What strikes me in your playing is the pedal. 
you are very using a diet pedal. Not too much and not with the beat, always with the resonance. When you are played acoustically here in this room, um, did you change something to it according to your feedback or did you play like you practiced with the pedaling? Um, I always do it um, at the moment. But uh -huh. of course, I know some places I should and should not. Like, absolutely not. Because obviously the pedal is the harmonic comp uh, harmonization mostly, but you have the melodic pa uh, aspect. And when you have all these quick passing uh, tones or the semitones, uh, the, um, it can be a little bit blurry. But I, I tend to think that your idea was to be crisp and clear. Was it, was it what you meant? Sometimes, yes. Like in the opening? Uh, Can you replay just the opening? Do you mind? Of course. Well, honestly, thank you. You're giving my soul, soul back by asking me to play on this piano again. <laughs> But it was, yeah, thank you. Thank Much you. We're alive. Bravo. Thank you. It's thank you. It's easier the second time. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, our jury members. And let me invite now uh, Doyon Kim. Where are you? Hello. Hi. I want to I want to tell you as well that um, it's very brave of you to come right after receiving disappointing news to hear what we have to say. So thank you for being here. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having uh, giving us uh, comments. And I'm very glad to be here. Speak louder so people in the room can hear you. Oh, oh thank you very much for your time and. Um, I'm glad to hear your feedback and want to improve. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've known you playing for many years and um, I just heard you at the auditions. So uh, your playing is not new to me, uh, but there's a difference with how your playing is perceived when you're in a hall and when you're in a room or a studio, it's a whole different ball game. And uh, for me, I mean, I really believe in your talent and I always did. I think you have a, a huge amount of talent that you could do with whatever you want. Um, what bothered me more than anything was your choice of Tempe uh, because maybe it's, a case of having hands that are too good. You know, you can do whatever you want, uh, technically, and uh, you sometimes forget that uh, the fingers sometimes can go faster than the ear can perceive. And if we can't hear it, it doesn't matter what you do. And so the clarity of the articulation uh, is something that is paramount. Because it, you know, it's, I, I very often give my students the example of perception of speed. If you go on a mountain bike at about 15 miles an hour, it feels incredibly fast. But if you fly on an airplane at 600 miles an hour, it feels like you're not moving at all. So the perception of speed is not the speed itself, but what it feels like to us. And if there is friction, if there is resistance, then the speed is meaningful. If there is no friction, like on an airplane, then the, the speed is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything to us. So sometimes I felt like uh, 
the speed was for speed's sake and not for the purpose of articulating the notes as fast as people can perceive them. Uh, and that was in several pieces. And it also led to some issues uh, in the scherzo of the Chopin, which I felt uh, you were in such a hurry to get to the next place that I couldn't hear what you finished. I couldn't hear the last note because you were. Which piece? Sorry, the know. Chopin sonata. The scherzo. Me, 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 me. Oh, I mean no, I didn't play the, Chopin. You, you didn't play? Oh, oh my God, I, I looked at the wrong. Right. What did you play? I played Beethoven sonata and uh, Petrushka. Oh, Beethoven and Petrushka, yeah, but uh, you played the uh, it's 31 3, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, so that. So what I was referring to, and I'm sorry, you know, we just heard 33 pianists, so some things get blurry, but I looked at my notes earlier and I must have looked at somebody else's notes, but what happened in your playing is that uh, you were always very, very cognizant of how the phrases and the progressions went, but the resolutions were not heard. And so, you know, you can hear a dominant or a dominant seventh or whatever chord for a long time, and then there's a re resolution that lasts only an eighth note. And if you, if you cheat that eight, eighth note and you're in a hurry to get to the next place, then it, you're leaving the listener with the dominant because you don't hear the resolutions. So that the speed that you had also prevented you from finishing things off and breathing enough so that the, the ends of things are clear. You know, when actors uh, study drama, they spend a tremendous amount of time on uh, articulating ends of sentences because people's voices tend to drop at the end. And uh, sometimes it doesn't carry. You know, you, you speak and your voice goes down. And, the people listening are not hearing it. Some of that happened in your playing as well. So uh, to me, that was the main issue. Otherwise, you know, I, I really respect what you do with the music and your sense of energy and, um, and commitment to what you're doing. Yeah, I would agree with that, uh, not surprisingly. Um, once again, banging the drum of humor uh, in, in the Beethoven. There's a lot of provocative things that are going on, uh, threatening to do certain things which could be somber and mysterious as in the beginning of the first movement and then suddenly laughing it off. And one, one needs to hear those things because uh, witty music played seriously, as I constantly say, sounds stupid. You know, if you, if you want the music to have the full benefit of what it's expressing, and it plays the, the, the card of, of wit and of humor, uh, then there needs to be more sparkle and more provocation. You want to lead the audience on and sometimes surprise them by what you do and sometimes give them what they want. Because you, ha you always have to have a sense of what you're doing and how it's going to interact with the audience, how they're going to respond to the inflections that you, that you give. Um, certain movements seem to, to, to work better than, than others. Uh, certainly, the, uh, you, you sounded more personal in playing the minuet to the Beethoven sonata than you did earlier. And I didn't feel that the A-flat major scherzo was rambunctious enough. It, it, it just didn't seem like you were having as much of a, of a good time. I know it's hard to have a good time in a, in a piano competition. But, you know, if, if you sound confident and enthusiastic, then the audience feels spoken to and, and starts to giggle, which is, in this particular case, a good idea. One, one other thing, I'm sorry, I, mean, I will let you talk in a minute. I just, uh, just wanted to mention that um, one of the things that you should focus on when you try a piano is to see what the, the limitations of the volume are. Because at some point, if you force the piano to play louder, then it wants to play. And this is, a, I forget which piano you played. The Fazioli, yeah. Uh, if you go beyond what the Fazioli and this Fazioli is, uh, allows you so much color and so many, so much contrast, uh, you lose the clarity of the sound. So it, start, it starts sounding forced, 
and uh, it loses the character. It just becomes something that is not natural. And in a few places in the Petrushka, you, that, that happened. Um, and don't forget Petrushka is a puppet. You know, and and uh, the orchestration uh, of the piece has more humor in it than it has bombastic playing. So you don't need to force that much. If you just ha have a good time with it, then the clarity comes through much better. Okay. The opening of the Beethoven is an invitation. Would you like dance with me or something? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, there is this um, melodic quality to the repeated note of the F. It could have been do la fa or do mi fa or but do fa fa. And that I was just mean. That's it's all. very stressful. <laughs> it's very stressful exactly to have it repeated. And I found that um, um, it made um, the way you approached it was very um, playful and very um, gentle. And I found that when you do the answer to it uh, in the character change, which is me, la la, when you have the left hand, um, if I may demonstrate instead of singing, because I already made full of myself singing with my falsetto voice. This. And I sense that you are trying to do the legato of the violin too and viola and the cello going mim, 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 mim. the mistinato and then the I'm sorry because I'm holding the microphone and then compared to which is sort of more tender and then you went more playful there and I was um, discovering how you um, tried to hold the legato and maintain this and you used very short pedal or did you use after the beat do you remember do you mind playing for us this opening because after all it's your playing that is in question Exactly what I thought. You played very short pedal after the note. Dum, dum, dum. And you hear it legato? Um. Right? Because it sounds legato, which is beautiful. No? Yes, I felt um, to make the individual voices um, cello and. Speak louder so the audience can hear you. Um, so, um, so I, yeah, as you, you said, like to, you, you were saying that you tried to play the voices mm. and the I instruments. didn't want it, but want to make it too, uh, mm -hmm. too act, um, staccato ish. Mm -hmm. So more like uh, pizzicato uh, or 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 stra yeah. stra um, um, bowed. Yes. There is energy in those repeated notes of the um, of the uh, ostinato, right? Pum, 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 pum. Um, and that's what I thought was very clear. And then about the technique of playing the staccato in the scherzo, la domila, la sisi, domila do do re re, I noticed that you use the wrist. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like us to hear the opening of it so I can show you what I wanted to suggest as an idea. Do you mind playing the beginning of it? I wanted to ask you, is it dry enough for you? La domila, la sisi? Dry. Dry? Yes, or do you think the beautiful resonance of the piano carries res residue of the sound? Um, According to acoustic and everything. Just my uh, way of uh, interpreting it was more like uh, not too dry, but to make it more melodic and uh, oh, you mean the accompaniment, the left yeah, hand? Yeah, the left hand. So yeah, because I was thinking that you were doing that in the melody in the right hand, 
and I was imagining that uh, the staccato scratch. just with the finger would be less long resonance. This is piano is very rich in overtones. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I wanted to ask you, when you played this here, compared to when you practice it, did you hear the sound come out differently than you were planning and you adjusted while playing? Uh, I guess I didn't really um, um, think about the projection of the whole. And the tempo and the acoustic was what, because sometimes we have an intention to play and then it comes out differently, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you wanted more. Um, you wanted to want yeah. drier and um, jumpy, more a kind of character. In this for example. In this uh, movement. What did you say it was for example? Before? Your teacher said. <laughs> 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 This is really a, a striking moment to hear you replay. Um, and thank you for, for demonstrating because it's a rare opportunity also for us who heard you once at the jury earlier to be here your, with your intention and saying, I think it's very, very helpful. I would love to hear what your intended tempo in the last movement really is. Uh -huh. Ha ha. Um. Can you start the last movement? Just just a few bars. Well, this is already s s a little slower than what you did. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you were, you know, uh, the adrenaline makes us um, perceive tempo differently than uh, when we're on stage than when we practice, and everything feels a lot slower. Um, so you have to adjust for that, and maybe use the way you, you hear the spaces between the notes rather than the way it feels, because if you go by the way your hands feel, it's always going to feel like you're playing too slow, because it, the, the adrenaline makes your hand go faster. So. Uh, if you, instead of going with the way it feels when you play at home, listen to the sound and try to remember the spaces between the little notes. And then that tends to hold you back a little bit. Okay. Yeah. A change of subject. Um, you and a number of your colleagues have a tendency to reflexively put the soft pedal down when the, the, the prescribed dynamic is under mezzo forte. And I would urge you not to do that. Because, you know, it's like the, the Germans say that if you salt food, it tastes better. If you salt food, it tastes saltier. And if you like salt, that's OK. And the sound of the soft pedal is a very, very particular one. One can pick it out instantly. And if you do that, you may get a sound that you like, but it communicates to the audience, and in particular to the jurors of the competition, that you feel that you cannot create a, a whole set of registers of delicate and intimate sound without using the crutch of the soft pedal. There are certainly places where it's, it's possible, even advisable, or even imperative to use the soft pedal, but not to do it all of the time because it, it cheats you from making the best possible impression with the widest possible span of dynamics. Well, you're saying basically that uh, piano level of dynamics does not deserve three strings for every note. Uh, that one's enough. And it's not just, it's the character of the sound that, that gets lost because there's no depth. It's, it becomes very shallow and it's very muted. And um, I, I, I know a lot, Mr. Levin is right, a lot of the people here um, use the soft pedal in order to play um, an, an absence of forte, but um, you should try to do everything you can with your fingers and only use a soft pedal when it's absolutely impossible to do it with the hands. And, you know, usually only when you have a, a two piano or three piano indication, not just piano, and sp especially not when things are lyrical, because it, 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 it forces the right hand to sound like you're putting it 
a noose around your neck. Yeah, and if you're playing a piece, Beethoven is an expert at this, you're playing a piece that suddenly goes to some crazy outlandish key, like the last movement of the seven, the E-flat sonata, where at the end he suddenly pre presents the, the tune in E major instead. You think, well, yeah, you want that to sound absolutely lunar, so there you're going to use the soft pedal because it just takes you to another world. But other, otherwise, you just should be a bit careful about it. I think, we, I think we have to stop again, yeah. don't we? Yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. And the third participant this evening, Anion Zhu, are you there? Please. He's from Tibi Chopin. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Greetings. Uh, I I really appreciate to uh, giving me advice to improve myself. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I could start just by saying that the sonata by Chopin, which you displayed for us, starts with the downbeat theme, accent pulsed, resi, resi, da dum, da da dum. And when you turn the page, it switches to upbeat. Ta -tum, ta -ta -tum. And so the amount of pedal that you used was in rapport to that energy between the upbeat and the downbeat, like a statement, which is, I want to tell you how much I am. It's like a conviction that you, and then all of a sudden, the same becomes, what if not in that? And how, and it is. And because a left hand plays, but he did it, did it, and uh, you have this pedal um, that um, resonates a lot because in the left hand, the fifth is resonating louder in the acoustic of the, of the overtones of the piano. In the third, in the right hand, reci, the reci is less. Um, I was wondering how much of that awareness of the um, uh, accent, or the pulse rather, the accent, the impulse, difference of the statement of the theme under two, expressions, one with the ta-dum, and one ta-dum, uh, you wanted to bring in your uh, initial opening performance. Can you play? Okay. Or can you speak and play if you want to explain? Or oh, you have a microphone there to enter. <laughs> impression that you're playing with a good deal more passion than you did when you played in the competition. Uh -huh. I think you've let go a little bit more right now. Okay. But I think one of the things that my colleague is saying is that when you start to play the tune, you're not, the second eighth note that you play is not a three note chord. Okay. But when you come back and, and, and play the tune the second time, the second note always is part of a three note chord, which means that it's, it's going to sound louder Heavier, yeah. than the note which precedes it. And you, or instead of hearing dee-dum, ba da dum we hear dee-dum, 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 which is very discombobulating because it makes the, the, the meter a little bit difficult to figure out. And the left hand changes because of the fact that you are on the sixth, fourth chord, in fact, fa si fa si fa si fa si fa si fa si, compared to si fa re fa si fa re fa si, because you're in the root position in the opening. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, maybe. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, uh, maybe again, my solfaging doesn't help. Uh, just to be clear, when you start in the beginning, it's you have a root position. And the second time in question, you're on a six fourth chord inversion. So you're on the dominant. Yeah. Whenever here is on the dominant, that's the, the statement. And then, Professor Levin said rightfully, the chord gives that impulse, it's heavier, heavier. 
And the first time you just have single two notes. But I think it's um, very nice to see you play um, your performance, not my, sorry, my example, because um, you seem to be very driven as soon as you start playing it. And um, the pedaling was my real question at the beginning. Um, do you, um, because you try to play it after the note to avoid the smearing over, I assume. Um, and again, my question is, since here it's an acoustical resonance place compared to a practice room, did you adjust on the spot or did you just play with the finger feel on the tip of the fingers on the keys? You have to put the mic, I think. Oh. Sorry. Um, so honestly, I'm playing with my finger feel. So mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm, yeah. And, uh, but the instrument is different, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah. So I need to, uh, to ch change the by different piano, right? Okay. Thank you. It's a heroic piece, you know. Yeah. And so I, I think you need to enlarge the dimensions of what you're doing so that there's greater passion. As I felt right now, maybe it's just partially because I'm sitting right next to the piano as opposed to being out there in the audience, which makes a huge difference. <laughs> but you see, uh, you have to reach the audience out there and not just play for yourself. You know, It's not just a private sort of thing where you say if two friends want to sit down on the couch and listen to you while you play, it's OK. Um, but I think you need more passion and more glow to the to the sounds where they're more opulent, where they're they're uh, more uh, lyrical. I, I don't want to go past your your Bach uh, Prelude and Fugue, with with which you open. It takes a great deal of courage to play a Bach Prelude and Fugue in a competition because it's usually a, a required piece for most auditions, and it, it's just something that you've got to get out of the way because it's required and not because you want to do it. Um, you did something which, considering that you're playing on a concert grand as opposed to an instrument that would have been known to Bach at his time, the fact that your interpretation was rather on the romantic side is, is something that, that I would take in stride as a listener, and I, I wouldn't criticize you for doing it, but you should just think about whether, uh, given the severity of this five-voice C-sharp minor fugue, uh, by the way, a great idea to play that before the Chopin, you know, having a, a ending with the C sharp major chord, and then you play the D flat minor, uh, the D flat and the E natural. It, it's very, very, very clever. I don't know if you did it on purpose, but but it it, it worked really very, very well. Uh, I wouldn't wimp out at the end of the fugue. You know, it ends, I think, strongly, not not apologetically. If you were playing it on the organ, which is probably how Bach played it, you'd be able to sustain those notes all the way to the end without a decrescendo. But it's just something to think about a little bit. Yeah. I noticed in your prelude, you purposely didn't play the two hands together. Was that a um, chord to melody vapor to valorize the melodic line? So, uh, maybe I need to, so, so you mean I need to, uh, pre so I not play together? And no, to I think it was not not play together. It was an artistic demonstration of the melodic line versus the bass. Da -di, da -da -di. That's how I felt it. It okay. was a, It's your wish. It wasn't that it wasn't together. It's, it's a Some presentation. Sometimes it's not. I want just. Uh, I uh, follow my feeling and uh, maybe and is it not together. Because the romantic music um, in the 19th century, mm -hmm. often on the piano, is written melodically harmonized. Whenever the baroque music generally is written okay. bottom up. So it's uh, the bass line, and then it spawns the melodic harmonic progressions that patterns everything. And I felt like that was the idea that you played the bass note before the top note. Is that what came up, or is it just on the spur of the moment? <laughs> well, it's, you know, if you listen to Rachmaninoff playing, he, he does, it, there's a term he used to, to discuss this, it's called fringing, okay. when, when you deliberately play the hands not together. Uh, and it's something. It's century, so yeah, and that's what that's how they used to play in the 19th century. Right? Early, a, and early. It's, it's, yeah. it's great to do it, but you know, it's like everything. You do it once or twice, and the audience is is charmed and delighted by it. You keep on doing it, and people realize that it's a habit. 
You know, one of the sad things about human relationships is that the, the characteristics of the people that most attract you to them are the things that later on are going to drive you nuts. And uh, the same thing is true with the musical interpretation. You have to be careful not to make a habit out of things so that they always feel fresh in terms of your choices. Mm. But in the 115 bars of your fugue, <coughs> there is a sense of build-up of uh, intensity that you brought, mm -hmm. which I thought was very obviously beautifully constructed, meaningfully constructed, because I still think meaningful is more important in this kind of music than only beautiful by whatever determination. But um, then comes that famous chord at the end, sort of the accident chord, the striking dramatic chord. And um, uh, do you know which one I mean? C sharp A, E sharp, G sharp, C sharp, right? Right. The A in the le in the tenor voice uh, and the C sharp major right. chord in the right hand. Keep going. killer. <laughs> yeah, I think if you, if you keep it strong, okay. it, it, it oh, conveys okay. greater okay. expressive power okay. than okay. simply making a diminuendo, which is harmless. Okay. Okay. Thank you. How did you practice this fugue? First I, first I want a different, uh, sound, uh, different uh, voice, of course, and then um, I, well, I put uh, the, the two, two melody together, so it went off the... Uh, uh, and... Uh, do si, do re, do si, la, do together, si. and uh, uh, so... Uh, sorry. And the uh, uh, harmony, and uh, yes, because it's about layers, right? Yeah, they they become harmony because they meet in a contrapuntal mm, crossroad. Yes. Um, have you written it? Uh, sorry. Have you written it by hand? Uh, no, I ha I'm not written it. Just I think you okay. will see great benefits of that. Okay. So, right, it's right. like you take the time to enter in the DNA of the thought of the composer okay. other than just by the playing. And then when you play, you rethink about how the layers... Um, uh, it's basically like a crossword puzzle and you enter in the intricacies. And of course, at the end when you perform it, it feels uh, as you, to you, this famous chord, for instance, we mentioned yeah. um, to all of us. Um, it's so striking, um, but it is true that um, I also think that uh, the opening with Bach was very brave. <laughs> Did you think about starting with um, the Chopin? No, I think the start with Bach can... Um, what I mean, so Settles you down? Yeah, so her to quiet and uh, to help me to enter the emotion and then I will follow with the Chopin, mm -hmm. yes. Can you, just before we end, and I think we have to end very soon, can you just play the very beginning of the scherzo of the Chopin? Uh, so, oh, so the scherzo, okay. <laughs> This is what bothers me. Tiram param. What I'm hearing is that you're in a hurry to finish right. it and go, on, and go on. Oh. And, and those those chords are so powerful, and there are two different harmonies there. Even though the the fa repeats daram param, each one has a different harmony on it, and you can't hear it the way you're playing it. So, so I want you to, to just think about the chord. Every chord, okay. And, and then the single note, and then the, the next chord and the single note. Sorry. Please play as 
Professor Kapinski said about this. Just da di da da. Yes. Without, without to worry about playing the other part. Okay. Ready? So you don't have to. That's fun. Do yeah. this. <laughs> Okay. You don't have to rush the shifting. It's really a piece for two pianists. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, the, yeah. the point that, that Professor Kaplinski is making is so important because yes. it, it has so many applications. It is never justifiable or advisable to cut short the end of a phrase in order to get to the beginning of the next one. Mm -hmm. So you're, mm -hmm. what you're doing is sacrificing the harmonic syntax of ba da ba -dum in order to be sure that you can then jump down and be on time what you're doing. Fact the audience will ex accept your breathing there. You know, right. when the audience can't breathe, if you don't allow the music to breathe, they can't breathe. And when they can't breathe, they suffocate. Mm. And you know, it's not a matter of technique because you have the technique to do yeah. it. It's a matter of listening. If you insist on hearing these chords, you'll play them. Okay. But if mm -hmm. to you, they're just a way of getting from one phrase to another, mm. then they become insignificant. Mm. In exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. In an orchestra, those who play ta da 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 don't play ta 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 ta. They count rests. <laughs> but you are the orchestra and the conductor and all the parts. And so the speed of shifting should be faster than the tempo so that you can touch before you prepare so you can have all the notes fulfilled and not sometimes sacrificed for the jump away. Mm. That's I think why we have to finish. Oh, sorry. Yes. I'm always talkative. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you, well, thank, you for thank you for thank you, thank you, Anjou, and thank you, uh, our distinguished jury, Professor Kaplinski, Professor Levin, Professor Naumov. I think it was fascinating, and I think these these feedback meetings are wonderful. I hope to hear more of them in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.